Hello, everyone. Let's give it a few minutes for everyone to join, and then we'll start. Hello, and thanks for joining. Today's talk is AppSec and AI, understanding the risks using AI specifically and how AppSec tools in general and DAST specifically can help mitigate them. My name is Frank Tucci and I'm the CTO for Invicti Security and Head of Security Research. I've been here at Invicti for almost a year and we have done uh, performed great strides in utilizing and analyzing uh, artificial intelligence and AI, and how this will work and impact application security as a whole, as well as the implications of AI in AppSec and using DAST. Uh, as part of head of security research for Invicti, this allows me uh, a pretty unique opportunity to interact with basically some extremely talented researchers and developers and engineers here at Invicti as well as try out new technologies and find new attack verticals, new signatures and those type of things using any type of technology, including things like OpenAI, ChatGPT, uh, Google uh, BERT, uh, uh, GitHub Copilot, etc. So that's what I'm going to give you today is a little bit of a delivery on some real world examples and some real world best practices to be able to deliver effective AppSec and some considerations on things that you may or may not have thought about when adopting newer technologies uh, like OpenAI's ChatGPT or things of that nature for automated code creation and or co code, uh, you know, sustainability to basically uh, be able to, uh, you know, scale your, your development teams using uh, the next generation, essentially, of uh, Stack Overflow, if you will. Uh, but that being said, we'll go on to the agenda. So today, really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some more real world examples of things rather than preaching my philosophies or my beliefs. Um, I'm gonna give you some real world examples of some research. Uh, and again, there will be uh, links to our blogs and things that are available for some of the research and things that we've done in the past that address these specific type of vulnerabilities and or considerations using AI generated code. Uh, the agenda will loosely be based on, uh, you know, are we ready as a whole? And that means, you know, as, as an industry, industry meaning anyone who consumes, uses, and writes software, are we ready to use that in production? And if we are, you know, what are the implications? Uh, this is... Uh, uh, a, a deep dive, uh, take a look there. I'll mention our blog where we're looking at that GitHub co-pilot case study uh, that one of our great researchers did, uh, as well as looking at AI generated code in more in general, uh, some of the software supply chain security risks, risks that can be introduced. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish it off with really some tools and considerations and practices to help probably mitigate that AI uh, related security risk. Now, before we get started, one thing I want to clear up is I, I'm I'm an AI fan. Um, in my previous role, I was head of product and AppSec at a AI company. Um, and, you know, I'm very much bought into the idea of AI. I'm a supporter of AI. However, I'm more of a supporter for AI for good and AI for furthering uh, cause and, and probably more efficiency and effectiveness uh, as well as automation. What I what I don't want is that kind of irresponsible adoption of AI or those bandwagon. Like if you read any you know of the million posts that come out on AI, there's always an opinion. So I'm much a supporter of AI, but I do think that what we need to do is look more closely at how we use AI, um, how we use uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence specifically with an AppSec kind of lens or perspective. Um, so that being said, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, before we begin here, just a really quick overview of Invicti Security. So Invicti Security uh, is a company that is essentially a merger between NetSparker and Acunetics that happened uh, quite a while back. Uh, if you're familiar with either of those solutions, uh, you probably understand what we do. 
Uh, our headquarters are based in Austin, Texas. We have over 400 employees, 3,600 plus customers. Uh, we're around a million apps that have been secured currently. Uh, and we're, our retention rate on our existing customers is somewhere around 111%. Now, you know, it, we offer uh, a variety of different types of things, right? So traditional DAST, yes, uh, but highly scalable, rapid uh, DAS testing that's more of a continuous discovery and scanning methodology is also what we offer, as well as software composition analysis and IAST, uh, which is interactive application security testing as well. So that being said, just a quick overview of who we are and what we do, and happy to uh, answer more questions further on. But for now, let's get started in what you came here to hear. So are we ready for AI generated code? Now that's the question. Um, we, we know there's gonna be traditional risks, but there's going to be risks that maybe we have not thought about or risks that actually may impact our compliance. Uh, compliance is an area where you may or may not directly say, oh, what is AI using AI code or, or suggestive code snippet or, or code block have to do with compliance? We'll get into that in a second. So we, we look at the trend of what's happening. We look at what's coming. We look at what is already here. We know that probably the future of a lot of high scale software development uh, and automation and efficiency is going to come from augmented or, uh, or artificial type of intelligence. That being said, we have multiple services here, right? From Salesforce, this is uh, Code T5, uh, I mentioned Google BERT, GitHub Copilot, uh, obviously OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT, as well as OpenAI's Playgrounds and paid options and full APIs that are uh, also available to uh, be able to instrument those solutions in uh, pipelines as well. So, uh, the, you know, the, the, the risk is here, uh, but that being said, you know, th these are things that are here to stay, I think, right? So is this the next, you know, I get asked all the time, is this the next blockchain? Is this the next, uh, you know, crypto type of thing where everyone's jumping on this and then it disappears or, or, or it shifts use cases and it's used for something completely different? Uh, I'm not quite so sure. I think that the impacts um, going beyond things like Merkle trees for blockchain, where the fundamentals of the math equations are really, you know, very, very solid. I think that a lot of that got lost in some of the things like uh, perhaps NFTs and Bitcoin and things of that nature. But with AI and the, its usage for this type of development, I think it's more of a staple and it with the efficiency in production and impact on revenue uh, for companies that develop and cr create, produce software, uh, I think this is more of a lasting trend that's here to stay. Uh, but that being said, we do have some very real risk in using these type of uh, uh, solutions. Um, and that's, again, what I'd like to talk about. So we, we did have a blog published, right? Uh, that blog in particular... Um, looked at some usage and suggestion from, from GitHub Copilot. Now, what is GitHub Copilot? First of all, GitHub's Copilot, or you know, you, some people could say, oh, it's more of an autocomplete for code. Uh, sure. Um, it, it's based on a model, a codex, essentially, or a model that is OpenAI in the background, or G, uh, GPT-3. So when we look at that, yes, it's, it's, it, is it chat GPT? Is it OpenAI's playground? Somewhat, it's based on that, and it uses that codex. Um, it can generate code in, in multiple languages. It can generate uh, development codes within IDEs. Uh, obviously, the language support is there. Um, and more importantly, it's trained on billions of lines of code that exist. Now, one thing that we know is that when we're using Copilot specifically, we know that it can pull code and pieces of code from publicly accessible repositories uh, throughout GitHub. Uh, this is good, right? It, it's something that that we want uh, to be able to do to to, to be able to uh, fill in the blanks, write things that perhaps already have answers to them. Uh, much of like we looked at a few years ago or five, ten years ago with utilizing open source libraries and things of that nature, 
where we're saying, okay, well, why would I write this from scratch when I have a library or component out here that's already written that, that does this function and I can easily import it? Well, this is kind of the same way, but more at the code level, if you will. So one thing that, uh, one thing that we noted here was that we know that the code that's suggested, and again, this is a direct reference from our real research that we did, the code that was suggested often contained some uh, basic vulnerabilities. And what I mean by basic vulnerabilities is we have an entire suite of software out there that has reduced inherently over the years the ability to do things like introduce SQL injection or cross-site scripting with safety measures that are built into a lot of the frameworks. Uh, we look at like Angular and React uh, frameworks and those type of things that we, we know right away that by using those frameworks, we have a lower level of risk for things like cross-site scripting, for example. Now, one thing we noticed uh, with the GitHub Copilot test is that when we asked or basically utilized the function to develop or bring in suggested code, we found uh, instances of injection points, so vulnerable code. Uh, excuse me, with, with SQL injection present or code injection present uh, that we were blindly bringing in. Now, this was a real world example. Again, everything's uh, available on the blog and I, I don't necessarily want to, you know, read a blog to you. You can do that on your own time. Um, but we, we, there is research out there um, and we do know uh, that these risks are real, right? So insecure code suggestions, code suggestions, uh, that come in uh, are, are fairly basic, right? One thing that we also noticed uh, that when we brought code in, um, what, one thing we also noticed here when we brought code in was that it didn't check for, uh, okay, we're a commercial use and we're bringing in this code in. Um, should we bring in uh, and do a license audit on that code? Where did that code come from? Uh, was there proper attribution for that code? The, the answer is no, right? So it's grabbing this code. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know where it came from. Uh, so licensing and attribution is, a, is another thing to be concerned about beyond vulnerabilities. Um, and we saw that specifically in our, in our co-pilot example. So the big question is, is it safe to use? Look, uh, you know, is anything safe to use? Is any code written? Do you trust code uh, 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 or an application inherently? The answer is no. You, you know, you're, you're not going to trust something without checking and, and creating those balances. So what, what we found here in our study, right, and we had two or three researchers that were looking at specific use cases was there was a little bit of a sat nav syndrome. And this was internal. This is internal use case to, to folks that were using uh, a copilot and things of that nature, chat GPT to actually bring in code that we were reviewing um, and that we apps that we were reviewing to take a look at, okay, exactly what's coming in. What does this look like, et cetera? Uh, look, the efficiency is there. I don't think anyone's going to argue that, but really what we noticed was that really, really a sat nab syndrome. And what, what I mean by that is uh, if anyone remembers, um, there's a, uh, an episode of The Office that I love, right? And, and, and this was uh, when uh, Michael Scott and, and, and Dwight are, are driving in the car after a failed sale. Um, and when they're driving, this is, you know, the, the era of beginning of uh, GPS navigation, right? Uh, they're driving and the GPS says to make a right turn now, make a right turn now. And, you know, blindly, Michael takes a right. Uh, it happens to be a boat ramp. Um, and he's like, no, the machine knows what it's doing. Trust the machine is what he says as he drives down the boat ramp into the lake. Now, you know, look, there's got to be some common sense there, right? So yes, the, 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 the navigation is blindly leading you wherever you're going. Now, is it, are you going to turn blindly into a lake? Probably not. Could you possibly make a mistake and turn blindly down a one-way street? Uh, that is probably a, a much more realistic case and very, very similar to what we like to take and look at in our real world examples. So, yes, it's a, a massive time saver, but you don't want to follow the advice blindly. Um, I think what whatever is recommended needs to be carefully reviewed, carefully analyzed. Uh, there are a couple of twists to this that I'm going to bring up um, in a second. One of the major twists that I'd like to bring up, however, 
is, I would say, you know, a little bit beyond this, right? We have very, very specific security implications. These aren't generics. I'm giving you generic advice right now, but let's dive into some real uh, implications. So what we look at is things like S-bombs, uh, things like compliance, right? Now, let's let's use uh, Log4j for an example, et cetera. Now, we know that if you had a, a an SCA uh, or an S-bomb generated and the next Log4j came out, you would say, okay, I know exactly where all of these things are. Uh, I know where the, the affected code lines are. I can go in and remediate those code lines based on my uh, SCA, et cetera. Now, what happens here is that you're taking extra diligence to not just look at code that you're writing or components that you're using, but what can that code bring in? Or is it going to bring in a utilized uh, uh, form or function for a, a log4j call that is implemented in a fashion that provides a, a access or something to a vulnerability? Where is that? Uh, is it bringing in a dependency? Uh, you know, things of that nature. We really do. Uh, need to kind of look a little closer at the software supply chain and where those risks are coming from. Uh, when you create an SBOM or even attribution, do you know where that code is coming from? Uh, it's not only going to help you if, if something bad happens, meaning that if the next vulnerability is released tomorrow uh, and it's utilizing a specific component or version, now you're going to have to make sure that everything that you've augmented or written with that AI is also logged and inventoried and cataloged appropriately so that you know where that component or that log could be, uh, if you will. So that, that, that throws a little bit of a curveball in there, right? Um, the next thing I, I would say is beyond software supply chain issues, this is one that we found in particular. So we were... Uh, obviously, Invicti is a commercial organization. So this was something that we did as an experiment uh, with our research group. And we were basically feeding, uh, uh, it, it was a, a, an open AI playground, and we were feeding information saying, okay, well, write me this, do this, give me this, you know, et cetera. And we're bringing that code actually into our app. Now, obviously, none of this got released in our production environments because this was more of an experiment. Uh, but we found multiple instances of those license compliance fails, meaning, um, you know, whereas previously we would know what we were using came with either, okay, an MIT license or uh, whatever license it was for that particular component. And then we knew what we had to do, whether we were developer or publishing uh, augmented or altered source, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What we found in this case was, that we were actually having to, we, we, it, everything scanned clean, right, uh, on that piece, because the traditional SCA will look at it and say, these are your components. But what we were doing is we were taking pieces of uh, code that had a specific license and using it uh, and not necessarily adhering or conforming to the licensing that that code was coming from. Now, this is a major kind of consideration uh, if you're being held to that SBOM or being held to that license usage for a commercial product, this is something that you definitely need to take seriously. Uh, and this is something that is not being considered with the most part for that autocomplete, if you will, or, and or either software building augmentation. So that is one thing that we saw in, 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 in real life, if you will, with some of our research. Um, if we had an audit and we implemented that, we would have failed. What would that have cost us in dollars? I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but the, the fact is that there probably is going to be quite an adoption of that blind, essentially, code coming into to the use cases uh, where there is license and or compliance kind of failures. Um, you know, that's something that we don't want to do, right? So. Uh, there, we have licenses out there that are that, are, that that we're pulling code from that explicitly prohibit any commercial use whatsoever. Uh, I could imagine that that would be a, pretty, uh, a hefty fine if that were to be found. Um, and these are these are things we're looking at now, right? We're we're really, really, really 
trying to figure out where the, these risks come from specifically, and the licensing and compliance is definitely something that we need to take a look at. Um, so going back to, to security specifically, um, we know that the data that's given from AI or ML or whatever it is, is only good or as accurate as the training set that the data came from. Uh, could the could the data set that that training that those training sets came from be tainted? Uh, that answer is yes. Um, we know that right now there are already kind of more advanced attacks to pollute uh, data for ML or AI attacks. Now, it's very few and far between, probably because the use cases and the attack vectors aren't there. These in the early days. We used to say, well, why are there so many viruses and, and malware being written for Windows and, and not Linux? Uh, well, uh, I think, you know, it wasn't that Windows was inherently that more uh, susceptible, but it was the fact that, you know, 90 some odd percent of your commercial organizations were running Windows desktops and that's where the money was, right? So that's where the focus was. And I think that as the adoption creeps up, the, the focus or the bullseye, the target, if you will, will be created on perhaps poisoning the well or poisoning the code that comes from these, these trained data sets. Um, you know, we know um, already uh, that people are using this for, hey, let me evade a spam filter, write me an exploit, et cetera, et cetera, write me malware that gets around this. Um, so we know that it's being used for nefarious purposes. Humans can already do that. We know that, but this is making things easier. So I think as those two things converge, um, and that is really the, the more mass adoption of AI, as well as the mass adoption of using AI for good and bad, uh, we're really setting us up here for a, a much more interesting security kind of landscape uh, utilizing AI. Now, do we use some form of AI to make our security products better? Yes, of course, right? We want to use machine learning. We want to use the data that we have. We have millions and millions of data points that come in from scanning millions of applications that have vulnerabilities. We want to learn from that. We want to get better. We want to get faster. Um, so we use AI for good to improve our product, but we also need to understand that there is that negative connotation where we're probably going to see a shift um that you know the shift meaning that that code and those attacks are, are going to be utilized and and be put into the mainstream uh, much quicker and probably with more efficiency than in the past and again the attack surface growing would be the primary factor there so oh, did I, okay so one thing we can look at here um, is, and, and this is a specific use case. And the reason I say it's a specific use case is because what happened here in this specific note is something that we, we were doing a project in house. Um, I, I don't want to spill too many beans here, but it, it, okay. I, we were asking for uh, a library in Python to do something very specific with JSON data. Um, and we were just like, okay, you know, is this out there? Does this exist? Can I find a library that does this without having to write it from scratch? So let's ask. Uh, what we found was we got two or three answers uh, from one of these AI solutions um, that sounded fantastic, right? They were very, the name of the library was very, very close to almost like what you would expect the real library to be if it existed for uh, that particular purpose uh, um, for that particular function. Uh, the problem with this was those libraries didn't really exist anywhere. They, they existed nowhere. So, I mean, we searched GitHub, we searched the internet, we Googled, we binged, we did, I mean, you name it, we searched and these libraries didn't actually exist. Although they were recommendations from the AI source, ChatGPT in this instance, for a, a particular solution. That led one of my coworkers to say, hey, I have an idea. He wrote the, he wrote a library, named it the, uh, he named the library what the suggestion was, uh, published it on GitHub, 
put some arbitrary garbage code in there. Now, this arbitrary bar garbage code was non-malicious in, in intent. It was more of a benign, right? More of a benign, hey, don't import this type of thing. Um, it actually got hits. So this is one thing too, whereas poisoning the well from a different perspective, can I purposely, uh, you know, th these aren't new ideas, right? It, it, these, this is typo squatting uh, in the next generation of typo squatting, right? So if I know that if I'm asking for a specific function or something of that nature, can I uh, poison that with malicious code? Now, in this specific case, uh, Chat GPT made it easier for us because they gave us this library uh, that was supposed to exist to do this function. It didn't exist. We created it, put some garbage code in it, and realized that if we wanted to be malicious, uh, we knew that uh, that ChatGPT was giving out a library name that didn't exist previously that we know that people are going to be recommended. So it's not just us, right? Other people are getting recommended these library names or things of these uh, of this nature for attack vectors, and they will blindly pull in this code. In this case, we you know it was a, a big. Uh, pretty much a non-event, but what that did was surprise us. We, we've never seen that before uh, where we had a, a library recommended that did not exist and we were able to create one um, and find hits and traffic being directed to it, uh, obviously with benign code, but it could have very well been uh, malicious. So, you know, this is one this is one uh aspect that we that was a little bit of a surprise if you will um you know we know that uh that is a potential danger because we saw it we know licensing and and code violations uh for licensing uh is a real threat because we saw that as well um the other thing that actually we're diving deeper that we're going to be releasing some research on very shortly is malware and prompt injection attacks. So new tech vector there. Um, you know, the prompt injection attacks are going to be very prevalent, uh, in my opinion, going forward. They're not necessarily new, but the vector of using AI for these prompt injection attacks in a public fashion rather than trying to poison uh, or, or prompt injection, if you will, with even something as easy as cross-site scripting uh, to be able to be spit back is something that we're going to go a little deeper on. We're really going to try the exploitation there. Um, and that's going to be upcoming research uh, that you'll want to keep an eye on. Now, we know uh, that people are using malware uh, or creating malware. Now, Again, what I stated earlier is this is not new, right? That we talked about the new form of typo squatting, if you will, for libraries that don't exist that are getting recommended. Humans can write very good malware. We know that. Uh, but uh, can we lower the bar? In other words, if I need to study and put in enough time to write really good malware for uh, you know, heuristic evasion, um, uh, signature evasion on various products, et cetera, um, that's one thing that, you know, a handful of experts out there or groups, hacking groups, et cetera, criminal groups uh, that get together to do this, that have that ability. But what, what, what if we lower that bar? What if we have AI do this for us where we want to bypass things, right? So, uh, hey, this is the software I'm using. Um, write me a piece of malware that does X and I can put a, a example code in there. So I can put example code and say, hey, this is what I have so far. It's getting caught with this filter. Give me something to evade, right? So this is like years ago, we were doing pen testing. We were doing WAF evasion where we were doing double and triple encoded payloads to get by a web application firewall, right? That's great. But we were advanced AppSec pen testers doing this evasion, making sure it's still fired, you know, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of this stuff was done manually. Uh, what if I had a tool to say, hey, you know, triple encode this payload, make sure it gets through this specific type of firewall, let's test it, let's put this through our labs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is lowering the bar. This is more like, uh, hey, I'm a hobbyist and I'm just going to go out there. Can I do this to destroy a company or to destroy somebody or to bypass something or even nation states, right? So now we have nefarious other actors to look at. Um, and can can this be even... Could this could they up their game from a nation state perspective? Um, so not only we're we lowering the bar, but we're also creating that high bar that already existed 
uh, for those experts to perhaps go one step further? Like what can AI be able to tell them that they can go one step further to, to, to perhaps find a, a, a vector or a way to uh, code something for evasion? Uh, these are these are things that are, are taking, uh, you know, very little effort from adversaries. Um, and these are things that are that are very real. And I think, again, we're going to see this uh, come out there to defeat a lot of the endpoint security. Um, again, uh, you know, the traditional days of uh, antivirus are gone. We know that we're going with things like EPP and, 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 and you know, the various CrowdStrike type of components, et cetera. Well, what if we could get around those more advanced techniques utilizing AI and things of that nature? So um, there's been studies out there. CyberArk researchers actually found live uh, malware code out in the wilds that was created by ChatGPT already. Uh, so that is that is something uh, I believe I heard that there's going to be a publication as well from another vendor. And I, I don't can't name that vendor yet because I'm not sure uh, when or if it'll publish. But there may be a very prominent type of um, malware blog that that's that's published that will be coming soon uh, that will be very similar to what the research found uh, researchers found at CyberArk. Uh, so another thing to keep in mind here um, now. What can we do? I, I think the biggest, the most important thing here to do is say, you know, look, we need to concentrate on the fundamentals uh, and the fundamentals cannot be ignored. Now, there are things we need to do to tweak those fundamentals to really help us with application security when utilizing AI, uh, you know, or addressing AI uh, related security risks. But those basics, basically don't trust uh, essentially but making sure those basics are in place and what basics you might ask well there's a lot to this and we could do a, a completely separate webinar basically on defenses and things of that nature devops devsecops if you will um from more traditional methods shift left shift right um we could talk however you would like but really what i'd like to do here is take a focus on this slide this is a slide that um uh, myself and a couple others created uh, when I was at Gartner. This slide here really embodies a, a lot of the protections that can be built in the CICD pipeline. So first and foremost, what I like to do is, uh, you know, we know that the folks that are using um, uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI, et cetera, for creating code just as they were stack overflow are developers so what i like to do is always take a very uh developer first or developer centric approach now that being said um, we know that we can do things like secure training uh security awareness etc cetera, etc cetera. but be as friendly and non-frictional to those developers as you can and you'll get that feedback meaning that whether you're implementing something directly into their IDE or their native environments, what we want to do is concentrate and say, hey, okay, maybe we have a plugin into the IDE. Maybe we're allowing developers to do this as they go. Maybe if someone copies something from ChatGPT into their uh, IDE, uh, it'll get flagged for being insecure, having an injection in point or uh, the ability for cross-site scripting or you know whatever it is. Um, so very, very, uh, kind of a, a left focus, if you will. This is nothing new. I hope this is nothing new to anybody. Um, but what I want to do here is concentrate on a couple of areas. Um, one in particular, um, before I get to DAST, is, is SCA. Uh, SCA is going to go through and a proper SCA is going to give you everything that you're utilizing within that. And those are your components, like I mentioned earlier. Now, what we're doing there is we're already doing, most SCAs are gonna offer you those license and compliance checks, as well as a, a, an SBOM and a, and a really good understanding of what components, libraries, or dependencies are in your software. Um, I, I think beyond that, uh, what we wanna do there too is make sure we're not missing anything that we're importing. Um, so there we're going to use a combination of SCA and SAS. Now, SCA is going to give you those components. It should pick up on those components. It should pick up on any libraries you're using. It may or may not be able to accurately pick up on the exact code that you brought in if it's part of a package where you're adhering to that license. So this is one of those new twists, right? So 
if I if I know that I'm importing an entire library, SCA is going to pick it up and say, hey, this looks like this. This is stamped this version. This is vulnerabilities associated. These are the licenses. It's all there. It's great. It's easy to read. Uh, but what if I take a part of that and just throw it into something I'm developing and I'm writing my own library, right? So we might have a violation there. We're going to have to be very careful, uh, meaning that we're going to have to do a little bit of checking. We're going to have to do SAST. Uh, we're going to have to do SCA. We're going to have to do some manual code review. Um, there, there are some really good shortcuts out there for, for, and again, shortcut I use as an efficiency for some manual code review on those pieces. And can we even use AI to find these things? Probably. Uh, but these are all new pieces that we're going to have to look at. Now, from there, we move on to something a little bit more interesting uh, again, and that is... I look at DAST or and in a combination with IAST as more of like real world testing, meaning that like I can look at source code and that's extremely important. You have to look at SCA for your components. You have to look at SAST for your source code. It, you, it's a must. But what is this? What does this app look like when it's being deployed into non-prod, into prod? Etc. What does this application really look like in the real world um, from an attacker perspective, right? Uh, if I'm an attacker and this application is, is sitting there and it's talking to 40 different APIs, three different databases, it has, you know, six different ways to authenticate. Um, I, you know, that's great that I can do all of that testing beforehand. But what DAST allows me to do is take that application and what it really looks like in a real world segment or a real world scenario and run actual attacks against it like an attacker would right i can do that with auth without auth etc i can try the multiple types of authentication um we recently launched a uh, attack signature to automate saml and sso attacks um, now this doesn't just attack your methodologies it also talks to the back end app uh, that may be the middleware in that uh, authentication stream for SAML or SSO in an automated fashion. So we're tying this all together and trying to basically give those real world tasks or those real world attacks in context to the application. Now, will this help you on your licensing? A little bit, yes, because we have some SCA mixed in there. Will this help on your uh, SAST? Um, a little bit because they find some of the same vulnerabilities with a lot less noise and pollution for uh, to and tuning that occurs with your traditional SaaS. But it will it will it provide an environment that tests configuration, hosting, services, integrations, middleware, databases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's where really the value of DAST and that we're delivering comes in, and that's really where DAST as a whole kind of accelerates. Now, we also look at something called IAST, right? IAST is interactive AppSec testing. What, what that does is it doesn't just look at uh, perhaps a request with a parameter or a fuzz with a parameter and a value and a payload and then the response. It looks both ways. In other words, it looks how, it, because it functions in the runtime, it is looking at the actual response and how it's handled from that application. So is there something stripping out that exploit after it reaches. Now, just because it reaches doesn't mean it's successful. Is there a mitigation put in place? Is there something put in place that basically denies that connection or that, that connection back or that response back that may or may not be malicious? And that's what IS gives you, that enhanced level of accuracy, looking at both the, the request and response, but the behavior of the application as well and any mitigations. And you can actually utilize DAST to navigate the application, uh, much like you could utilize QA and automation and you know, Selenium and all these other scripting uh, things that you may do in QA to, to automate your IAS. So these are all very, like, very valuable and powerful type of, uh, of, of things that may or may not be imported with OpenAI. There might be something that's developed in OpenAI that you're not going to find with SAS or SCA because it, it lives in a component that someone wrote some glue uh, that connects something or a wrapper that connects something. Uh, and there might be a vulnerability in that that's only present uh, when you're, you're essentially having this application uh, spin up a, a, maybe an ephemeral service, open up a connection, do something of that nature, and then close it down or, or, or shut it down immediately. You would never know that uh, with more of a static test, whereas you would know that with a dynamic test. Um, so 
to to kind of look at this, if you will, in a, in a more of a holistic type of view here. Um, you know, the, these are things that I'm I'm recommending uh, to, to take a look at and to keep an eye on. Um, you know, I think they, like I stated, they are a permanent part of the software world. Um, I think that we're going to see increased adoption for good and bad. Um, I think we'll personally continue to use AI to make our products better. Uh, I think other people out there will be using AI to make their products better. And I, and I do believe in it. Um, but don't trust it, right? Treat everything as untrusted until you test it, until you know uh, what it is. And don't release it into production until it goes into a test environment and you can really test out things with numerous tools, SCA, SAS, DAS, IAS, et cetera. Uh, these are things that we want to build in. I mentioned, I showed you the pipeline. Sure, we can have build fails, uh, and, you know, different type of sensitivity for different kind of apps. Uh, all of that can be in a completely different subject, but we really, really need to take that diligence when we're looking at these things, right? Um, and, and that's that's that that's critical. Um, I mentioned some of the uh, advantages here. Uh, the advantages that, that that are you know that go beyond a bit what I said too is scalability. Um, the, so I'm not just talking to the slide. I'm going to talk in general here, right? So what what we look at is scalability. Um, we can run continuous discovery um, and scans in an environment, right? Something as simple as this is my IP range. Th these are the domains I own. Uh, let's do continuous and nonstop discovery to find new hosts that are running web applications. Uh, why is you know my phone that or my my phone? Excuse me, my coffee maker that someone plugs into a network port uh, a network port in your office all of a sudden is on a VLAN that shouldn't be on that VLAN. Now you have you know this other web interface and. Is it an entrance attack vector, et cetera? So there's constantly that. Developers are constantly doing things, they're developing own environments, uh, developing things on their local machines, et cetera. Uh, there's always uh, containers being spun up. There's always environments and things changing on a rapid, very rapid basis. So what we allowed to do, and some of the, the what we do is a little bit of that uh, attack surface discovery, right? So a constant discovery and then, and then, oh, I found this new thing that has a web interface. Okay, go scan it. Uh, scanning at scale, we have clients that are scanning, you know, thousands and thousands of applications on a regular basis, uh, simultaneously, constantly. Uh, very large e-commerce out there where it's like, look, stuff's changing in my store by the minute I release a hundred times a day. Um, I don't want to have to stop and start and stop and start. Just run this thing continuously. Yes, the app changes, find new links, fuzz new parameters, do new functionality, new APIs, grab a new uh, API that's out there, uh, test the API, right? We support uh, REST and GraphQL. Uh, find these endpoints, find, find these configurations, fuzz these APIs, test these APIs. Uh, test these applications, automate as much as you can, right? So this is really where that scale um, and, and that more enterprise friendly type of uh, uh, scalability comes in. And a AI ties directly into that. We're using AI to make these things faster. Uh, we are using AI to make these things more accurate. We, we are giving you a very, very low uh, 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 noise to, to signal ratio, right? Uh, very, very high accuracy. Um, all that being said, we're also finding things that are implemented using open AI and AI generated code that is very much impacted in a, in a non-prod or production environment. So with that being said, I, I kind of started with the basics of SCA, SAST, et cetera. Yes, you can implement the pipeline, be developer centric, the powers of these solutions, but more untrusting of that code. I really also gave some good examples of some things that we found internally and how we exploited and taken advantage of them. Um, I encourage everybody out there to dive into our blog specifically, uh, the Invicti research uh, uh, blog, as well as Invicti security blogs. Uh, we also maintain some open source repositories on GitHub for custom scripting and things of that nature for things that we've written in particular. Uh, we have our um, test websites available with uh, uh, some of the availability to be able to test real world scenarios and really kind of tie this all together. Um, and again, uh, we will be continuing to push that AI envelope um, and use it for, 
for as much good as we can, as well as give you and the community out there and all of industry really uh, a heads up on making sure that you're protected if your developers and folks start utilizing uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT, uh, et cetera, the, the, the numerous type of things that are out there for, for both bad and good to be able to make sure that you're mitigating your risk and your license compliance and, and things of that nature. This is the end of the presentation. I hope you found it helpful. And now let's take a look at the questions. Okay, I see some good questions coming through. Uh, the first question I see is, I've seen some web scanners that claim to use AI technology to find security issues. Do you think that's where security testing is headed going forward? That's an excellent question. So like I mentioned, we use AI to make our tests better, meaning we have data sets that we look at and we want to be more accurate. We want to make sure we're not giving you false positives. We want to make sure our signatures are accurate, our speed, uh, everything that we're doing. And we use AI and ML to do that. Now, if we're using AI to actually find security issues, um, I would say that that is definitely not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, we did one experiment where we were trying to have AI do a secure code review for us on a fairly uh, innocuous piece of code, nothing very proprietary or anything like that, uh, because we do know that as using something that's free, you become part of the uh, data set or the training model. Uh, and there's a lot of proprietary information that could even leak from that. But that being said, um, I do think that we'll see AI to, to continue to build um, both help security, um, help security issues as well as the, the, the folks help um, try to create security issues or vulnerabilities going forward or attack vectors. So um, I do think AI is here to stay for a while. Um, and I do think that almost every security vendor out there that I know of uh, doing you know, more kind of modern uh, tooling and development is utilizing some form of AI or ML to, to boost their products. Uh, so I would say, you know, I, I wouldn't jump on anybody who says, oh, well, all of our uh, security products are, you know, utilizing AI and that's why we're the best. I, I wouldn't necessarily jump on that and say, oh, they've got to be great. Uh, but I would say that everybody is definitely taking a look at it um, and everybody should probably be using it in some fashion to create efficacy, uh, more e efficacy and more efficiency as well with their existing tool sets. Question two, uh, you mostly mentioned Copilot, but recently everyone is talking about ChatGPT. Uh, have you seen or tested the security aspect of code from ChatGPT, especially when compared to Copilot? Yeah, I think this question um, kind of, th this question is interesting. So I, I, there was a couple of instances where I addressed this specifically, but, um, you know, Copilot is is using the codex, uh, the GPT-3 codex. So it's using a lot of the similar uh, similar function, even though the, obviously the training sets are, are probably different uh, based on uh, GitHub uh, slash Microsoft and then, you know, OpenAI and, uh, you know, every time someone does a query, right, there's data being gathered and uh, people are using this for, for different type of purposes. So, you know, it's both, right? We, we found that Copilot actually in, it introduced an injection uh, in, in our code test. Uh, and we actually uh, found that ChatGPT recommended a library that didn't exist. And we jumped on it and created it and actually uh, had some hits. So uh, I think ChatGPT, because of its accessibility, um, we know that there's, you know, a, a huge free tier out there. You don't even need to really sign up. You can go out there and use chat GPT and it's getting a lot of the media, uh, attention, a lot of the blogs, et cetera. But before that, you know, GitHub Copilot was out there, um, and they were doing their thing. Uh, yes, it was a more closed environment. Uh, you know, the, 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 the 11 o'clock news anchor wasn't necessarily jumping on the co-pilot bandwagon, whereas they probably talk about GPT a few times or, or, or AI, right, for various uh, types of considerations. So uh, I would say that we, we've looked at both. Um, and they both have different risk factors, in my, in my opinion. I think they're a little bit different. Uh, I think the, the, the training set from uh, co-pilot is a little more closed. 
uh, whereas the, the chat GPT is a little more open, but they both have to be treated essentially as untrusted until uh, you can verify what you're running is secure. Question three, would you say AI is finally here to stay or is there another hype cycle that go, will go away? Uh, we've seen similar excitement uh, in the past more than once that we're seeing right now with AI. So I, I think it's going to ebb and flow. I think it's here to stay, but uh, let's not forget Hal, right? Um, let's not forget, forget Hal and, and, and artificial intelligence from back in the day where this was always kind of an interest, right? So yes, it spikes and peaks and yes, it drops. Uh, but, you know, back in the days of, of things like war games, uh, et cetera, there's, you know, there, there was... Uh, there was that aspect or that interest in robots and, and you know, Rosie from the Jetsons and, and having that feedback, right? So even though we're, even though this is new with much, much, much greater kind of capability, um, I think it's here to stay in computing, especially uh, for, for, and not even consumerism, probably for forever, right? So it's always kind of been there, but it, it will rise and fall with popularity, just like most things do when something new and hot comes out. Uh, but I do think this does have potential. And I think we're at the point now where there is the, the, the ability to create an inflection point in the usage uh, and, not, and consumerism as well as corporate uh, to create an inflection point that keeps it on the radar a little longer than, you know, perhaps do you want to play a game or, or cleaning and mopping and, and my, my, uh, my Roomba that's sitting over here or something of that nature. But uh, I do think it's here to stay, but I, I, I you know, it'll go in cycles, but uh, this, this is something where our capabilities and the maturity of what's out there now does have a bit of inflection that I think will probably remain fairly high for uh, the next uh, recent future, for sure. Question four I see coming through, how is getting AI generated code really any difference than when people blindly and copy paste and paste from Stack Overflow or similar sites? This is, this is whoever asked this question, um, this is probably, th this is something that I actually wanted to dive into a little deeper and I might have skipped part of it, but this is a great question. So traditionally with Stack Overflow, um, you would, you know, do a Google search or you're searching on Stack Overflow itself. You're very specific in what you're looking for. Yes, are you copying and pasting code snippets or, or things of that nature blindly into your code? Yeah, is it good? No, it's terrible. Um, you're doing very much the same thing. However, it requires, in my opinion, requires a more manual process and it requires more uh, experience in asking the right question to get that answer in Stack Overflow with the parameters you're looking for or editing that code that's in Stack Overflow um, a little bit to make it work for your use case. So there's a little bit more scrutiny and time that takes um, into getting that code into production. Now, uh, should you still not trust that code? Absolutely. Should you still scan that code? Yes. Should you use still uh, SCA, SAS, DAS? Yes, you still should. But it's more of a, a slower scale, a slower proportion of it being actually implemented into production. Whereas, uh, let's look, uh, Copilot, OpenAI, ChatGPT, whatever we're using, we can do this much quicker than, uh, with much quicker, much less skill, and much, uh, I would say, much more automation uh, using like an API from uh, OpenAI or something of that nature to put code in production without that background knowledge, right? In other words, you can have it write a whole code block, not just a snippet that you're copying and pasting in. You could have it write a thousand lines of code soon, who knows, maybe more, uh, where it's doing things like that for you with very or more limited contextual knowledge or expertise in that either either that language or, or coding or developing in particular and especially security so this is something that i see being very very easy for people to take advantage of um, very quickly and so there i think the risk is a little higher because it does require less knowledge and it can be done much much quicker and at scale much greater than you could with something like stack overflow um, and we could even see this embedded into specific pipelines um, or being utilized in a method where 
you're letting code auto generate based on this stuff um, where there's less eyes on it. And that's where that trust level changes a little bit. Um, so yes, it's similar, but in my opinion, it's something that needs to have a little bit more focus because of the speed and accuracy and the uh, lack of knowledge that you need to really get to that point and, and probably could impact adoption. Thank you everyone for joining and for your time and participation today. I hope you found this content useful and I thank you again for spending your time here.